Good morning, good noon, good afternoon. Welcome to Thursday VMR. It's a delight to have you all here. And all of you might be wondering, wait, something's not right. And yes, something is not right. I am not in lounge clothing today. And that's because of uh, this, the enormity of the occasion. And the enormity of the occasion is I have the honor and privilege of discussing no, I'm kidding. Don't worry. I'm wearing it because I have to for a job related thing. Yusuf, it's not you. It's not you. Uh, Yusuf is, uh, I consider him a friend and a, and a sibling and um, a brother and um, would love to be in lounge gear with you, but I have an event right after this. Um, but we're really, really excited. I got to co-discuss with Yusuf when he first joined the team, and this is the second time we're doing so. And I really believe Yusuf needs no introduction to VMR. I don't think Yusuf realizes what he's done. He's been the first, um, one of the first um, resident members of the VMR leadership team. And I think if you've ever um, been a student or a resident or an attending and know how bonkers crazy it is to be a resident, um, uh, Yusuf has somehow um, made it possible to be a thriving member of the CP Solvers community while managing basically a double full-time job as a resident. Um, and the impact that he's had is unreal. He started his own series with management reasoning, um, has made it into the world of one of our most popular VMR series, the subspecialty uh, VMR series, and then behind the scenes does enormous things. Even behind behind the scenes, uh, double behind the scenes, Yusuf is working on some really cool ideas, including our um, our website, and has become a um, a true leader of CP solvers in a mere matter of months and joining us is. He bridges the brilliance of his IQ, which is on display in VMR, and then his EQ, um, which we see um, all the time and all the other spaces. So Yusuf, it's an honor. It's so, so exciting to be able to discuss with you. Thank you for all that you've done um, in the space of VMR. It's crazy to think that it's just the beginning. And I'm excited to celebrate today by a very, sounds like a very exciting and a very tough case from Parisa, who we'll pass the mic to in a moment, but would love for you to say hello, Yusuf. Hello everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. You flatter me with your words. You're, that's too kind. I've uh, grown so, so much uh, since joining this community and meeting all of these amazing people. I love discussing with you uh, because uh, because the way you discuss is that you, it looks like you already know the answer ahead of time. But what people don't know is that you don't. But when people are discussing with you, you the way you navigate like your trainees, it's like, oh, he already know. It looks like you already know the answer ahead of time. And you're always like, uh, guide us towards the answer. And that's amazing. So uh, I really, really look forward to the case, Parissa. I'm a little bit nervous, but look forward to it. Parissa, welcome again. Um, I see that there's a couple of people I don't uh, I don't recognize your name. So maybe you can reintroduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Uh, my name is Parissa. I'm an international medical graduate from Iran. I'm currently doing some translational research at Yale and happy to be here and learn from you. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, it's a two-way street, Avrisa. Tell us a little bit about uh, about you outside of medicine. You presented a, a mind-blowing case of abdominal pain to Mengu, Austin, and Alec recently, and I got to listen to that. It was really, really in awe. I'm curious to try to get to know you a little bit outside of medicine. What do you like to do? Uh, having in New Haven was a great opportunity for me. It has a really beautiful nature surrounded us, and it's whether it's hiking, biking, or just gathering some time with friends, everything, whatever it's, do, do, it's happening outside, it's great. And I'm really enjoying it a lot. Amazing. And Sounds also like we you. have a great pizza even in New Haven, which mm -hmm. is super delicious. <laughs> I'm I'm guessing that one of your most fun days is a hike and a pizza afterwards, huh? That exactly. <laughs> You already know me. Oh, you know, I'm I'm very simple. I love being outdoors. My wife and I just came back from a beautiful run outdoors. And I think um, maybe not pizza at 9 a.m., but um, maybe at <laughs> noon. We'll see. We'll see. Well, thank you so much for uh, for being here and for bringing in another case. And a special shout out to Andrew, who I, I just realized you're in very close physical proximity to, who helped you put this case together. So without further delay... Um, Let's jump in and um, celebrate you both. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you the case in five alicot and we'll pause after each. The first alicot has the chief complaint, uh, which is bloody stool and fever in 60 year old male who is presenting to ER. Uh, I will pause here and then we'll give you HPI in the next alicot. 
Yusuf, there's so many intriguing threads to pull on. I'm I'm really curious. Where do you think your mind is inclined to start? You got fever, you got bloody stool, and you got an older adult. Where are you inclined to begin your thinking? I think, like you mentioned, uh, because I'm in residency, my first idea is always triage. And when I hear bloody stool, I'm always like my brain is jumping. Oh, show me the vitals now, so I know uh, in which direction we're headed. Uh, the uh, bloody stool, I would call it like blood per rectum, uh, which we a lot of times assume is from the GI tract, but it's not necessarily from the GI tract. We we just have to make sure this could be like swallowed to blood. This could be uh, from a nasal bleed, for example, and not necessarily from the GI tract. But my, my first uh, idea is uh, I want to triage this person and see their disposition. Do I, do I want, do they need higher level of care and support? Or is this someone I can wait on and uh, see in which trajectory they head? And uh, this can be assessed uh, one in through vitals and two by the amount of blood that they're, lo they're losing. So if I ask them and they tell me they're losing, uh, they're having five to six bloody bowel movements in the last uh, day, for example, I'd be more worried. And or if their vitals are abnormal, I'd be more worried. And uh, in regards to diagnostically, I, it's still very early for me, but I would just label in general fever, doesn't mean there's some form of inflammation, but I wouldn't localize it yet. Absolutely superb. I couldn't agree more with you. I think that's exactly my instinct too, is to be cautious about what where the problem is and to be simultaneously open to a very severe sinister problem because the GI tract is a wide open tube that you can literally lose your entire blood volume into. Um, if we assume for practice, the most um, likely and the most morbid situation that bloody stool does in fact represent um, a GI bleed, what do you what do you find valuable on HPI to help you understand that space a little bit better? If we assume that it's a GI bleed, what do you think a Parisa might enlighten us with on the HPI? So one thing could be if the the color of the stools is it like melina or uh, is it light colored stool? Is it frank blood, for example? Excellent. Excellent. I think that's a really really powerful space, and I I'll give you uh, I'll share with you um a landscape that I think is very, very helpful. And it has four parameters in it. And Yusuf touched on four of them, all four of them already. The first thing to recognize about a GI bleed is that actually it's a diagnosis made not by generalists, but by GI doctors. And all we can do is give it our best shot as to whether we think the patient has a GI bleed or not. And you can see Yusuf already wondering if the patient has another source of bleeding. So the first arm is always a diagnostic one, is how can I prove that this person is actually having a bleed from their GI tract? And the best one is to actually literally see blood come out of their mouth or their rectum. So diagno a diagnostic landscape is open. That's one category. Um, the other three categories are things we do in... Um, maybe uh, one of the one of the other three categories we do frequently but the other two kind of get slipped under the radar the first the second is localization so is it upper or lower and Yusuf already began, began that journey by telling us that the color of the stool is going to be really really important and that has a profound local uh, uh, localizing value so so far we talked about the GI bleed is always a diag there's always a diagnostic category of how confident am I that this person is bleeding and rely on GI to confirm it. The second is, where are they bleeding from? The third that Yusuf touched on is how badly are they bleeding, the severity of the bleed. So if you're trying to think about it, there's one arm that's like trying to figure out, are they actually bleeding? Then there's three categories of where, what location in the GI tract, right? Severity, how much is pouring in? And there's one other key one that almost never gets talked about that I think this chief concern forces us to do so. And in order to explain it, really have to go back to um, what we just did. Where in the GI tract, how much is pouring in? And the final category is depth of bleeding, meaning how much has the process eroded into the actual intestinal wall. 
we know that all GI bleeds represent an abnormal connection between a blood vessel and the lumen. And the question is, how much destruction of the normal GI architecture has occurred to enable that abnormal connection? Most GI bleeds are surface bleeds. That abnormal connection is at the surface. But there are some features that should make you worry about the possibility of a deep bleed. And um, I think this case will allow us to explore that possibility. But in order to just share the basic beginnings of it, I think, Yusuf, you and I can reflect on your entire experience as a medical student and as a resident. Would you say that fever is either common unusual or rare in a patient that you're taking care of who has an overt GI bleed, what percentage or what rough estimate would you say is fever a common thing or a rare thing? What do you think? Uh, in my experience, uh, without data backing it up, is that the vast majority of patients with GI bleed will be uh, without a fever. And a lot of them will be on a blood thinner, for example. And with the frequency of uh, DOACs now increasing, and especially with uh, DOAC and AFib, uh, mm -hmm. it's become more common to be associated with medication and less likely associated with like fever and a secondary syndrome. Exactly right. The vast majority of GI bleeds are painless, afebrile, and do not show up on a CT scan, regular CT scan. Deep GI bleeds are GI bleeds that either contain fever, pain, or show up on a CT scan. And the fact here that this patient is febrile makes us wonder, is their GI bleeding a transmural process? And I think that thread is gonna be really important to tug on, but let's just keep that to a side. Now, Yusuf, you and I are gonna be probably paying attention to how confident are we that this person is bleeding? How severe is the bleeding? And then where in the GI tract are they bleeding? But we'll have to keep a gaze open to, huh, they're febrile. Does that mean it's deep? And if it's deep, what significance does that have? All right, Parisa, tell us more, please. And the whole story started when this gentleman was having a trip to Philippines and all his symptoms started 10 days ago when they were on a family vacation. And he realized four to, four to five days after their arrival, he was experiencing the onset of profuse diarrhea, which was happening more than 10 times per day. Uh, it had it wasn't red initially, but it had it developed red appearance after a few days. Uh, his symptom was accompanied by abdominal pain and fever. However, it was not related to his food intake. Uh, he was drinking clean water when he was there, but he reported of consuming few times undercooked food. Uh, he sought medical care there, and they did a stool examination, which revealed one to one to two entomoeba histolytica cyst under microscope. Uh, he was put on oral metronidazole, rifaximine, and resosodotril. I will put it in the chat. And um, although he was adherent to his medication, he has not received uh, much improvement, and he was advised to. Uh, admitted to the hospital for further treatment. However, he decided to come back to the U.S. and uh, the, his presentation is just one day after the arrival. Uh, his symptom is not associated with nausea and vomiting. And uh, in terms of uh, rest of review of system, he has weakness, abdominal pain, and fever since the initiation of his symptom. And the rest of review system is negative. Uh, in terms of his uh, past medical history, he has hypertension, he has GERD, uh, anxiety, and also he is reporting of having, uh, last year, he has a, um, a skin lesion which was excised and diagnosed with basal cell carcinoma, but he has not received any kind of treatment for that situation. Uh, in terms of his medication, he's getting linozoprir, hydrochlorothiazide, and pantoprazole, and alprazolam. Uh, in terms of his social, he uh, is a former smoker, and uh, he had a remote history of using crack and cocaine. Uh, 
uh, he is not currently reporting using any illicit drug and he is not using alcohol. In terms of his family history, uh, his mother has coronary artery disease and his father has hypertension. Also, there is a history of colon cancer in his maternal aunt. Uh, I will pause here to hear your thoughts. Risa, you're presenting so smoothly. It's like, I feel like I'm on the wards with you when you know the patient so, so well. Wonderful job. Yusuf, what are you thinking so far? What what did this do for you? Yeah, I, I think uh, this history gives me a lot of uh, quali semantic qualifiers that give me a lot of syndromes that have specific diagnoses or differentials. One of them is fever in a returning traveler. And uh, my my brain immediately jumps to SMD, Salmonella, malaria, dengue, and I apply that in general to all returning travelers. But obviously, we have to apply that to our specific patients and the specific symptoms that they have. So, uh, in addition to Salmonella, malaria, dengue, which is in common in all returning travelers, uh, this patient seems to have a syndrome of inflammatory diarrhea. Uh, they have had at least a, a diagnosis of entamoeba which may have explained uh, part of it, but it seems that they have persistence in that uh, diarrhea and their body diarrhea. So uh, in general, when I think of inflammatory diarrhea, I uh, uh, wonder about uh, infectious etiologies. And, and in addition to inflammatory, I'm gonna add acute inflammatory diarrhea. Uh, it's acute to subacute, it's within one week. It's not, more, it's not chronic. So I, I wonder about an infectious as my first screening. I uh, wonder about things like uh, invasive uh, salmonella, uh, invasive E. coli, vibrio, cholera, which is usually watery, but uh, in this case can become bloody in some instances. Uh, the uh, fact that it did not resolve but with uh, the first line treatment makes me curious if they sent a culture initially. Uh, and then my second line of thought is, could this be non-infectious since this is VMR, but uh, my first time of screening will be infectious until proven otherwise, given that it's acute inflammatory diarrhea. I think that's absolutely superb. It's amazing to see how much our problem has now shifted towards inflammatory diarrhea instead of a GI bleed. And I think it goes to show you that um, the depth of the bleeding is really important here. So the depth across the wall is probably pretty high as whatever this process is, be it as infectious or inflammatory or ischemic, it has eroded through the wall to the point where you can be very confident that you will see evidence of this on the CT scan and in stark contrast to the vast majority of GI bleeds where you don't. Um, and so, yeah, I think that the semantic qualifiers that you mentioned here um, are very, very apt. And I'll just share one knowledge nugget about entamoeba uh, organisms. Unfortunately, um, the value and the diagnostic specificity of seeing entamoeba in the stool sample is limited by the prevalence of asymptomatic colonization and a lot of um, uh, non-pathogenic entamoeba. So the entamoeba that we're on the hunt for is entamoeba histolytica, but there are many other non-histolytica entamoeba uh, in, uh, entities that can be found on in the stool that may not be um, uh, pathogenic. So here, I think another semantic qualifier to add is, is this refractory, is this an entamoeba histolytica invasive diarrhea uh, refractory to treatment, or is this actually a non-pathogenic entamoeba histolytica distracting us from the core problem? Um, so unfortunately, that'll be something that we'll have to grapple with and a, a small piece of information about the diagnostic value of seeing entamoeba histolytica on the stool. And the person, do we know what the treatment was or what the medication was? Uh, he was on metronidazole, rifaximin, and risacidotril. Okay. I was just wondering what the organisms that we already, the medications that they got, a buzzword that I had is that the like, organisms that cause HUS, for example, may worsen if you treat them, but I'm just keeping that in the back of my mind, not at the front of my differential. Yeah, I think Yusuf, you're bringing up a really important thing for us to try to practice before we get that we get confirmation of these things, kind of like what you prompted Noah and I to do last time, which I really enjoyed. Um, um, what what do you what do you think are complications of infectious diarrhea or inflammatory diarrhea that you frequently see? 
So in anticipation of the exam and the data, what, what is your mind filling in those slots and expecting them to be, uh, of course, open to adjusting them when they come back, but we all have a sense of what, what we might see. So what, what are you looking for on exam or, or labs that may be consequences of this issue? Yeah, so I would want to, uh, uh, this can uh, develop uh, colitis, for example, toxic megacolon, so on and so forth, related to the GI tract. Mm -hmm. uh, they can develop things like uh, HUS, like uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia in relation to an infection, for example. Uh, I would want to rule out, obviously, hypovolemic shock uh, slash uh, septic shock uh, on my exam as well. Uh, and in relation to treatment, uh, I don't, I, this is not common, but metronidazole, for example, can cause a neuropathy, uh, but I don't foresee that in this patient, for example. I completely agree with you. I think it's really telling. I have nothing to highlight, but to underscore the something subtle that you did, which is that you said, I'm open to septic and um, hypovolemic shock. And it's amazing how often patients with colitis do get hypovolemia, maybe not so much the shock level, but definitely hypovolemic. But their hypovolemia is usually not hemorrhagic. So a small but important teaching point is in this patient, you would probably not be rushing to give them um, your algorithm for treatment for GI bleeding. Most of these patients have a lot of volume loss, but their hemoglobin doesn't drift down too dramatically. So I completely agree with you. The most common complication of diarrhea we see in the hospital is hypovolemia, but that hypovolemia is not hemorrhagic. It's usually just uh, a regular old fluid. Um, all right, Parisa, tell us more, please. Um I'm going to give you vital sign and physical exam and a bit of the lab data. Uh, this vital sign was obtained when he went to the ER. It's the first, it's first exposure. His blood pressure was 122 over 66. Uh, his heart rate was 105. Uh, his respiratory rate 16. He was not febrile and his temperature was 36.2 and he was saturating 98% on the room temperature. Uh, in terms of physical exam, um, everything were normal, except that in, in his HENT, his mucosal were dry. And uh, his, uh, in, in his oscillation of his heart, he had tachycardia and he has um, lower abdominal tenderness without guarding. His neural exam is normal, and he, in terms of his skin as extremity, he was um, his skin was pale, but no rash or jaundice was appreciated. Uh, in the in terms of his basic lab data, and uh, his sodium was one hundred twenty six, his potassium three point one, and his chloride was eighty four. His BUN was eight and his creatinine was 0 0.76. Uh, his glucose was 162. Uh, in his CBC, his white BC was 8.9, band 29%, hemoglobin 12.1, hematocrit 34, MCV 78, Platelet uh, 370. His total protein was 5.2 and his albumin was 2.4. His haptoglobulin is 433. His LDH is normal, 169. Bilirubin is, uh, bilirubin is normal and uh, liver, liver enzyme are normal. PTIN are also normal, LIPAS normal, his ESR was normal, but his CRP was 52.4. Uh, regarding the concern for um, amoebic dysentery complication, he also had a CT scan, um, which showed diffuse colitis, and also his CT scan was noted uh, indeterminate hypodensity in his liver and spleen. Uh, liver hypodensity was 1.7 and splenic hypodensity 1.4. Uh, I will pause here to hear your thoughts.
Amazing. Well, Parisa, this is so, so intriguing. Yusuf, what are you thinking? Uh, I was not expecting the hypodensities with the acute diarrhea, given how acute it is. But it definitely gives us another frame of to view this uh, case and to add differentials to it. Uh, in general, uh, how I approach hypodensities, uh, in addition to, let me just sorry, to start off with the labs are definitely impressive in that they are abnormal, but they're all expected. Like I would expect the sodium to be low, I would expect the potassium to be low. Uh, and uh, even the albumin in the acute setting is expected to be low as like a negative inflammatory marker. Uh, the thing that I did not expect was the uh, liver lesions and the colitis. Uh, and uh, when I evaluate uh, colitis, I, I think of uh, things like uh, infectious colitis, like uh, Salmonella camp uh, Campylobacter, C. diff, Entamoeba, et cetera. I think of STIs. There are autoimmune causes like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, Bichette's, ischemic and infiltrative. Uh, when I think of liver lesions uh, on top of that, uh, in terms of infections, there could be uh, uh, amoebic liver abscesses, for example, due to entamoeba. Uh, there could be, second, for example, uh, secondary to echinococcus. Uh, all the organisms that cause uh, culture negative endocarditis can also cause liver lesions. Robbie has a NEJM paper on this, is that Coxiella, Bartonella, Brucella can, all can cause liver lesions. And all the causes of uh, uh, granuloma can also cause liver lesions, like sarcoid TB, lymphoma. But uh, overlapping that with the acuity of it, I would still prioritize the infectious causes. Uh, Fatiola is a, I don't know how to pronounce it. I've just been reading a lot about this recently. It's like associated with water crest, can also cause liver lesions. The last one is if the syndrome was chronic, I would think of uh, VIPomas and other like tumors of the GI tract. But because this is so acute, I would put those less likely as well. This is like a very broad differential, but uh, in general, uh, I would start with that. I would uh, send a stool culture. Uh, in this case, only because it's so inflammatory. Uh, and this is a case where we uh, might need uh, tissue to make a diagnosis or serology as well. Uh, and I think that's all I had. Yeah, I mean, that was a great approach to colitis, liver lesions, and how I love how you synthesize it at the end. I completely agree with you. I think it's really interesting to, re to remark on this case and how anticipated these lab findings are, but how unusual the space is in the United States. Because when you take care of patients with acute diarrhea in the United States, you'll learn that 90% of acute diarrhea in the US is viral in origin. And there are five circumstances where that that's not true. And this is one of them. But the other circumstances are when the patient has exposure to antibiotics, and you have to think about C. diff, the patient has an extra intestinal cause of diarrhea like Legionella, but you know what happens when the, to the rate of uh, infectious diarrhea when a patient travels? The rate of traveler-associated diarrhea being non-viral is 90%. So the chances that this person has a non-viral cause of diarrhea because of their recent travel is through the roof. But most causes of traveler's diarrhea do not cause a severe syndrome this bad. This is unusual. And I think that the severity of the syndrome is best captured in a subtle lab abnormality that Parisa snuck in there, which is that this person has 29% bands. The amount of um, neutrophilic response this person is having to this to this infectious organism is remarkable and impressive and alarming. And I think that um, it would really, really push me to think hard about treatment. And I think, Yusuf, you already talked about the dangers of treatment, because if this person has shiga toxin producing, producing E. coli, uh, we might increase their risk by giving them antibiotics. But I think when somebody is this sick, the overwhelming odds of them having shiga toxin producing E. coli is so rare that you probably would actually treat this patient. Uh, most people, I think, would treat this patient because they're too sick to just hang your head on one uh, small but real possibility. Um, I'm curious, Yusuf, what you made of the MCV. Um, it's low at 78. Did that... Um, I think it's probably fair to gloss over that, but if we spend a moment thinking about like what an MCV of 78 might signify, um, how how do you think we can weave that in here? I think the MCV is a measure of acuity. 
uh, like the fact that it is like a slow makes me think that this is the process that led to this MCV has been more uh, chronic rather than acute uh, to cause it this uh, to be low. The patient does have a past medical history of hypertension, GERD, and anxiety, which I do not expect to cause a anemia. So uh, that's also makes me, in, in real life, a lot of patients have comorbidities that will cause this microcytic anemia or they will have iron deficiency anemia. Uh, but it makes me think of a chronic process going on. And uh, the other thing that I didn't mention earlier is I would definitely want to know an HIV uh, status upfront in uh, any infectious case and in any case in general. Superb. Absolutely superb. Yeah. I think HIV is crucial here. I'm really interested if the MCV is signal or noise, because if it's signal, it means the patient has either thalassemia, which is unrelated, or they have iron deficiency anemia. And iron deficiency anemia does not develop in 10 days. So the question is, does this person have a subacute issue in their GI tract that has now become more and more flagrant and more and more, um, more and more pronounced? Um, I am, I'm glad we have colitis on the CT scan. Um, if you had to sit and think about your a very outstanding differential of infectious, inflammatory, ischemic, or infiltrative, um, the word that Parisa used is diffuse colitis. If you if we had to brainstorm this and think through this together, how do you think the diffuse nature helps us think through infection, inflammatory, uh, ischemic, or uh, infiltrative? What do you think? I would think it definitely makes ischemic less likely uh, upfront because it, it would be in a vascular territory. Uh, in infectious, I uh, I usually think of uh, more localized as well. Or, but although I I wouldn't be surprised if C diff can cause this, for example. I think you hit the hit the hit the money shot. The real value of diffuse colitis is making ischemic colitis much less likely because the SMA as uh, perfusion ends at the transverse in the mid transverse colon where the IMA takes over. And so, if you have diffuse involvement of the colon, you must have simultaneous SMA and IMA disease, which is virtually incompatible with life. So, ischemia becomes much less likely when the colon is completely uniformly involved. So um, infiltrative is also a little bit less likely to be in infiltrative and so extensive, though it's possible. Um, so you're down to primarily infection or, or inflammatory. And the pattern of inflammation in IBD is also very powerful because um, uh, uh, colitis without ileitis makes Crohn's a little bit less likely. And colitis with involvement of the rectum makes, um, uh, makes a UC less likely. So this pattern of diffuse colitis is very, very suggestive of infection, which I think you were worried about from the get-go. But the real point here is that the colitis doesn't really restrict the differential diagnosis, but having a thoughtful conversation with your radiologist can help you, can point you in the direct in the in the correct direction of which eye to follow. And a diffuse pattern is very much suggestive of an infection. Cool. All right. Parisa, we're uh I feel like we're making progress, but I feel like the distance between a clear answer and now is still high. I'm curious what you have next for us. Such a great discussion. And in this Alicot, I will give you uh, more lab data and imaging. Uh, HIV, HPV, and HCV were all negative. Blood culture was negative. A stool exam has not, didn't have any ova and parasites. Uh, adenovirus PCR negative, cholesterol difficile negative, GRD antigen negative, and all the GI stool pathogen PCR, including Salmonella, Shigella, Yersinia, Campylobacter were negative. Because considering the uh, hypodensity was observed in the CT, MRI obtained, and uh, the liver lesion were more compatible with hemangiomas. And also the previously described hypotense esplenic lesion represents another hemangioma with regions of cystic degeneration. At this point, he was discharged with continuation of metronidazole and the plan to switch to parmomycin. Uh, antibody and antigen test was not ready at this step. I will pause here because next Alicot has the diagnosis. Uh oh, you said, <laughs> what are you thinking? Uh, first of all, I'm reassured that the uh, liver lesions were likely benign. Uh, that ma makes me feel better for the patient that this is not like a, 
a malignancy, although that is definitely still on the table. So thinking about lymphoma, for example, the LDH is, is normal, right? Or is it elevated? LDH is normal, 169. Okay. okay. Uh, it's still an, uh, potentially on the differential, but the LDH makes me feel a little, a little bit better. That, okay, this could this be less likely lymphoma? And the having uh, the liver lesions being benign also reassures me that could this be less likely to be uh, malignant, although it's definitely still on the differential. Uh, the uh, typical infectious uh, organisms or the bacterial organisms that we typically think of are uh, are uh, essentially ruled out because of the stool cultures. Uh, things like tuberculosis is, is definitely still on the table uh, is, and would be diagnosed by uh, biopsy. Uh, I don't think of uh, viral etiologies just because uh, I, I usually expect viral etiologies in patients who are immunocompromised. Uh, uh, other uh, atypical organisms that are still possible uh, uh, Whipple's disease typically does not cause like a colitis on imaging, for example, uh, and uh, other infiltrative causes. Uh, we don't see any other like lymph adenopathy to think of sarcoids, for example. Could this be IBD? Uh, but this would be uh, atypical for be just like the first presentation, although uh, it is possible. Uh, so I, I wonder if the next step would be to uh, do like a colonoscopy slash uh, other low-hanging fruits would be like fungal studies and like kind of urine fungal studies, although the highest yield I imagine will be colonoscopy plus minus biopsy or repeat imaging in a while and then and then considering that if it is persistent, if there was an organism that we missed. I wonder, Parissa, was the patient still febrile, for example? And were they still having symptoms? No. No, he was not febrile. Okay. And, and that helps me uh, wonder if this was like an acute process that resolved or is this like a subacute process that we just uncovered that we happened to do a CT scan in a patient who had diarrhea when they uh, had travel. Yeah, Yusuf, I agree with you. When you're seeing these patients and you have so much data elapsed, I think what happens over time is so powerful because the urgency to get to the bottom of the diagnosis is certainly reduced when the patient just gets better and you feel like, well, um, if the patient is better, um, uh, the, the goal has been achieved in many ways. But I think what you're doing is you're outlining essentially the pathway to diagnostic clarity for acute inflammatory diarrhea, with the caveat being that the acuity of the disease may be tempered by the low MCV, and we may be actually be dealing with acute on subacute uh, in, uh, uh, in gastrointestinal disease. And I think that pathway, if you're being very simplistic, is you're saying, I need to test the stool. And then I need to test the blood and the stool testing is all PCR or OVA and parasites. And then you test the blood for antibodies and the antibodies are mainly, mainly against parasitic organisms like entamoeba or strongyloides um, primarily. And then you do a colonoscopy and the colonoscopy is meant to, um, uh, in terms of the infectious uh, yield is basically the equivalent of doing a BAL. So in a, somebody with a lung infection, we first send their sputa, send their blood, send their urine, and then we finally go for it and intubate the, the actual organ and um, study it in, in more detail. And the yield on colonoscopy for infectious diarrhea is not low. Sometimes you see certain parasitic organisms only on colonoscopy like cystospora or isospora that you don't see on the ovan parasites. And a notorious organism that you'll only see on colonoscopy is CMV or CMV colitis, which is basically the only viral organism you can see, uh, 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 the, the only viral organism uh, that causes that can cause an inflammatory diarrhea. So like you, I don't know the answer, but I think the pathway for this patient is blood testing that may reveal an antibody, and then colonoscopy to study the infectious possibilities that remain, which I would guess are maybe viral CMV, rarely TB if this is a subacute, acute on subacute process, um, and then um, parasitic. And if that's negative, I think uh, studying the biopsy sample for inflammatory components, which are either IBD or mimics of IBD. But I think that's the journey that this patient is on. Um, it's hard to imagine a pathway to an answer that doesn't involve ultimately taking a look at what's bleeding and why it hurts so much. Um, what are your thoughts? 
I think in addition to what you mentioned, the only thing we didn't talk about are like uh, things that are sexually transmitted, uh, which mm -hmm. we didn't take a sexual history, but I don't know if this is relevant or not, uh, like uh, gonorrhea slash mpox and things like that. I think that is such an astute point and a point that works worth emphasizing over and over and over again. The sexually transmitted infections that are at play in a patient with um, diarrhea are mainly HSV, HIV, syphilis, um, a lymphogranuloma venerum, a version of uh, chlamydia, but then also actually sexually trans sexual transmission of GI organisms like Shigella and Giardia. The a sexual history is crucial in this patient, though the uh, the probability of an STI is slightly reduced by the fact that this is a diffuse colitis. In the majority of patients with STI-induced disease, the disease tends to be restricted to the rectum, calling proctitis, which is even more momentum to um, ask that history. Um, so I completely agree with you. I think that's a missing piece of data. Um, and you probably would have even more force or license to ask it in a case of proctitis. The diffuse nature of the infection going past, past the rectum reduces that probability, but doesn't eliminate it for sure. Awesome. All right, Parisa, we're really, really intrigued. What uh, what did you find for the patient? Amazing, great discussion. It is really interesting for me how you are usually the discussion, including everything and how you are looking at the scenario. It was amazing. Uh, in this article, I will reveal the diagnosis. Uh, patient uh, discharged and he came back to the hospital two days later with severe hematochezia and blood pressure 100 over 67. Uh, at this stage, colonoscopy performed and shows severe pancolitis with area of deep uh, cratered and ulcers exposing underlying muscular asteria extending. Uh, and also the biopsy obtained was showing uh, entire colon shows has mucosal expansion and creep distortion, a creep abscess and full thickness lamina propria lymphoplasmocytosis and neutrophilic infiltration, uh, which, which confirmed the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis. And also the antigen and antibody of the entomobula histolytica became negative at this stage. Ooh, Yusuf, what are you thinking? I think uh, this is an amazing case, Paris. I thank you so much. What, what an excellent case. Uh, I think uh, we captured this patient on their... Uh, first presentation or first time that we captured them in their uh, presentation of uh, ulcerative colitis to the point where they had pan or diffuse colitis, uh, which uh, will be uh, prior to biopsies. It's very hard to initially think of, but we thought of all the things that can cause the colitis in addition to ulcerative colitis. And uh, I think it's a very, very cool case. Amazing, Yusuf. I uh, I think one thing that you uh, have emphasized in situations before, which is a, a fever in a returning traveler can be related to the travel or completely, completely independent of the travel. And here, I'm not sure if it is or it isn't, um, because guess what triggers patients with IBD uh, underlying UC to flare? It is very possible that this person had UC and had a unrecognized infection cause him to flare or it may just be that he has going to have a UC flare coincidentally to spoil his trip to the Philippines. It's very, very hard to know. Um, in retrospect, what do you think was the um, what do you think were the key clues to the final diagnosis? The uh, MCV, I think, pointed us towards a chronicity, like a certain degree of chronicity. The uh, diffuse colitis made us think of uh, rule out ischemic etiologies as a as a component, and then the negative culture I think was also like a pivot point towards infiltrative. I think that that's absolutely superb, and it was really cool to see how we could have been distracted by the abdominal CT findings. Parisa laid a trap for us in a very astute way. She said, "Hey, he has entamoeba solidica. Look at this liver lesion." Um, it goes to show you how both the entamoeba histolytica may be non-pathogenic and, and the CT is a, a MRI with an angioma, you know? Uh, amazing. What were your reflections on discussing this case, a second, uh, discussing a case uh, round two compared to round one? I think my teaching points for myself is that uh, 
try to like describe the syndrome in the first few aliquots instead of trying to uh, name diagnoses. I think that's a skill that uh, helped me discuss better. Uh, and uh, like you said, it's very funny that the liver lesions are just like hemangiomas. And because it's in real life, that's the past etiology of liver lesions will be hemangiomas. So prevalence wise alone, uh, we should start with hemangiomas and then everything else. But in the <laughs> yeah, setting of EMR, <laughs> we mentioned everything else. Exactly. And I, I promise I closed loop on this. Remember how we said we'd have to come back and close the loop on depth of the GI bleed? You hear the you hear the words that Parisa said about how deep those ulcers were. And I think that is a powerful clue. Whenever you have GI bleed with either fever or pain or a positive CT scan, you know it is a deep, deep, deep process. And ultimately, most deep processes are probably going to need a colonoscopy to get diagnosed. Um, uh, Parisa, I'm curious, what did you learn from this case when you were putting it together? The thing mainly helped me to understand this case was a diarrhea thought train. I was trying to realize if this is the center of the gravity of the presentation or all these symptoms are accompanying anything else, which was not the case for this patient. He did not have any dyspnea or any skin pre presentation, which could guide us to diagnose any other things. And also, um, the other thing Andrew taught me was the age distribution of the inflammatory bowel disease. We usually expect them to happen in patients uh, 15 to 30 years old of age, but there is also another, there is a bimodal age distribution for IBDs, which might happen in patient uh, age 50 to 80 years old even. And the other thing I really liked about this case was extra intestinal manifestation of the entomobica histolytica, Although it was really triggering, but usually, um, and liver abscess are the most common type of that, but usually there is a gap between the presenting of the symptom and developing the abscess, which is uh, 8 to, to, to 20 weeks, which was not the case for him. And also, more importantly, it is uncommon to have both extra intestinal and intestinal manifestation at the same time. Amazing. Pure golden pearls about entamoeba histolytica. Really, really marvelously well done. Andrew, I know you, I can see you ferociously typing. I can't tell what, if it's in the chat or whatnot, but any wisdom you'd like to share since you dive deep into this case? I've got nothing to add. No, it was, uh, it, it was a really interesting diagnostic journey. Um, the, in real life, the um, hepatosplenic lesions also threw us off. So we, we we're all in the same place together. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, Thank you for bringing this case and uh, sharing it with Parisa. And we really, really learned a lot from it. Um, I'm really excited for Anmol's uh, teaching points. Take it away, Anmol. Okay, so this was an amazing case and amazing discussion. Um, I totally love the case. And talking about the GI bleed, uh, every GI bleed in our body, as Dr. Rabi mentioned, it represents a connection between a blood vessel and the lumen of the GI tract. So um, if, whenever there's a complaint of bloody stools, we need to see three important things. Um, first of all, we need to see that, uh, that the blood is coming out of rectum and we have to triage the patient. We have to understand what is the severity of the blood loss. Um, is it severe enough to cause hemodynamic instability? Should we first triage the patient in emergency to see if we have to um, uh, treat a for hypovolemic shock so first we have to check for the severity that is by counting the number of bubble movements and secondly we need to see the color of stools if it is frank blood or melina because it helps us in localizing whether it is an upper gi bleed or a lower gi bleed uh, which helps in, in identifying the cause of the uh, uh, of the presentation thirdly we need to understand what is uh, the depth of the bleeding that is how much that process which has caught, caused the GI bleed, how much has it eroded into the intestinal wall. And mostly the GI bleeds are surface bleeds. And uh, so therefore the vast majority of GI bleeds, they are painless and they do not cause any fever, fever and don't show up on regular CT scan. So in this patient, we can see that uh, he has a bloody stool and a fever. So that fever points out that the depth of this um, bleeding is could be deep because um, fever uh, plus bloody stools, we realize that transmural uh, bleed could be there. And uh, talking about uh, his travel history, uh, he had a recent travel and we cause, uh, talk about the infectious causes, salmonella, malaria, and dengue. 
are common in returning travelers. And these symptoms, the bloody stool and fever, they represent acute inflammatory diarrhea. And uh, as Dr. Yusuf mentioned, it, it is infective etiology until proven otherwise. And um, the entamoeba species in the stools, uh, which are, we can see in the HPI, it could be pathogenic species as well, or it could be the non-pathogenic forms. So uh, in this case, the pathogenic forms um, could be uh, maybe refractory to the treatment, or it could be the non-pathogenic forms. And uh, uh, when we see a patient with the uh, uh, bloody stools or, or which seems like infectious diarrhea, we need to look out for some, uh, for some complications. That is, uh, he could develop toxic megacolon or complications like HUS. And we need to see, uh, mon continuously monitor the vitals for the patient if he's developing hypovolemic or septic shock. Hypovolemic is the most common one we need to look out for. And on the CT scan for this patient, we see a hypodensity, that is the liver lesions, and it could represent many things. Uh, it could be an amoebic liver abscess, or it could be, as we said, this patient's blood culture was negative. So it could be a culture negative infective endocarditis, which got embolized there. Or, uh, uh, the, it, or maybe it could be the infectious causes, which are a priority in this case because of the acute presentation, as we can see from the history of present illness. And uh, as I mentioned, it is uh, it looked like an acute diarrhea. And so 90% of uh, the cases of acute diarrhea in US are viral in origin. And uh, obviously there are some other clues. If, if he had exposure to antibiotics, it could be C. diff, diarrhea. And, and um, but it, it, this patient had a history of traveling as well. So chances of a non-viral diarrhea and, and not in travelers is 95%. And talking about the low MCV, which we can see in this uh, lapse, it makes us think about a chronic process or uh, a subacute process as well. And we need to divide this thing into four uh, main causes and we need to rule that out one by one. That is ischemic, inflammatory, infiltrative, and infectious. Uh, so this, uh, so th we can see that this patient had diffuse colitis. And with diffuse colitis, ischemic colitis is very less likely because, uh, because of the fact that uh, it would have involved simultaneous uh, superior mesenteric artery and inferior mesenteric artery involvement, and that is not compatible with life. So here we rule out the ischemic causes. Uh, so it could be infection or inflammation. And the next test which we need, uh, which needs to be done in this patient is for uh, the stool studies for PC. Uh, PCR for ova or parasites, or we can look uh, take blood sample to look for antibodies. And then uh, finally, colonoscopy should be done. And uh, colonoscopy is important in certain cases because certain organisms show up there only, that is, I, uh, that is isospora and CMV colitis. And uh, sexual history is important in patients uh, who, mo who mostly have proctitis. And we need to rule out HSV, LGV, and syphilis in those patients. But we knew that this patient had diffuse colitis. So, but that is uh, an important history to be ruled out in the cases of proctitis. So uh, we saw that uh, in this patient, fever uh, was there. And it, that the uh, symptoms, these can be uh, related or unrelated to travel. Uh, th that could be a, a flare-up of uh, ulcerative colitis. The travel could have uh, uh, precipitated that, but um, it could be connected or not connected. But uh, ultimately, it came out, the diagnosis came out to be of ulcerative colitis. And there were some clues in the history which uh, which uh, represented a subacute nature of this illness. And uh, at the last, we got to know that ulcerative colitis has bimodal age distribution. So, um, so there were, uh, so that's how we actually came to the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis. And um, yeah, th that was a very, very interesting case. And I think I need to read so many things after this to increase my knowledge. Thank you so much, Parisa. And thank you so much, Dr. Ravi and Dr. Yusuf. As uh, Yusuf will insist, it's, he goes by Yusuf and not Dr. Yusuf, and I will do the same because Anmol, you are a colleague. That was absolutely amazing. Uh, I can't believe you remembered all that. You're literally a sponge. Um, that was really, really cool to see. Thank you, Yusuf. That was outstanding. It's an honor to share the stage with you. And the biggest thanks to Parisa for such an incredible case. Really appreciate you and uh, Andrew behind the scenes uh, uh, making it happen.
All right, y'all have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, we'll hope to see you tomorrow for RLR at the same time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.